welcome back to the channel. It's been a couple weeks since my last video. I've received a, a lot of great feedback from many different people in the last couple weeks about the first two videos on cooling towers. So that's uh, very excited to see that. Some people that I haven't heard from in a long time, very happy to hear from you. Uh, my colleagues that I work with day to day, lots of great comments from them. Some of the business partners that I have that I work with off and on, some good feedback there. So very excited to see that. It's very encouraging and it certainly helps make it easier to keep producing these videos. So please uh, always welcome feedback. Uh, my network has also been expanding over the last couple of weeks. Uh, we've been seeing some more facilities management, uh, property managers start to sign into the network. So I'm very excited that you're doing that. I'm hopeful that, that this content about HVAC systems and mechanical systems and buildings uh, will help you in your day-to-day -day life. I'm not totally sure uh, as what property managers and facility managers do on a day-to-day -day basis. So if there's anything that uh, you are looking for, uh, please, any of those people, reach out uh, down below in the video or through my website, jeffwhunter.ca, and that goes for anyone who's uh, viewing the channel. So today I wanted to continue on in our series about cooling towers. One more episode uh, just on cooling tower selection. So if I have a building with a defined cooling load, what are the parameters I need to use to select an appropriate cooling tower? Now in the previous episodes, we talked about open style cooling towers, closed circuit fluid coolers, and those differences, uh, the construction of those systems, what makes up those cooling towers, um, and some of the energy efficiency stuff around that. So today, let's talk about design parameters and going about selecting that. Stay tuned. First thing that I wanna cover here with respect to selecting and sizing cooling towers is just some terminology that we should be aware of uh, before we get into that. Uh, and the first term that I wanted to cover is um, approach. So approach is the difference between uh, the condenser water supply temperature and the outdoor ambient wet bulb temperature. So when we're selecting a cooling tower, we're generally using a piece of software that uh, we tell the software what city the cooling tower or the fluid cooler is going to be in, and it's going to pull up the ASHRAE weather data on that city. And so we're going to use um, the wet bulb data that we get from ASHRAE, and ASHRAE gives it to you in a 0.4% method, a 1% or a 2%. And, and what that really means is uh, for 0.4%, 0.4% uh, of the time, the outdoor wet bulb temperature is going to be uh, higher than that. Or 1% of the time, the wet bulb temperature is gonna be higher than that. So on a design basis, you can choose how uh, specific you want to be or how stringent you want to be. And, and typically, um, you know, I do generally see a 0.4% method applied for the design day. And that gives you some uh, level of confidence in the extreme weather events happening that that cooling tower or fluid cooler still can reject the amount of heat that you would like. So just for example, if we've selected a, a, a fluid cooler or a cooling tower using the 0.4% outdoor wet bulb temperature for a particular city, uh, the days or the, the hours that it's above, that outdoor wet bulb is above uh, the 0.4%, what's gonna happen is the building loop is going to start creeping up in temperature. The zones, each of the zones in the building are still um, rejecting heat or the, the coils in those zones are still absorbing heat from the zone and dumping, uh, dumping that heat energy into the building loop. Uh, now that could be a, a heat pump loop and we're serving a fluid cooler or we're uh, fan coils and we're dumping into the building loop that's going to the chiller. Um, so what's gonna happen is that building loop temperature is gonna start to uh, creep up because we've basically gone beyond the design and we're not able to, the fluid cooler or the, heat, or the cooling tower is not able to keep up with the cooling demand. Uh, so that loop temperature starts to creep up and that has a big impact on the performance of all the connected equipment because all that equipment has been selected based on that uh, design day and that design data. So that's something to watch out for. And we also have to consider over the lifespan of that cooling tower or fluid cooler, outdoor temperatures are probably 
uh, outdoor temperature trends are probably going to change. And ASHRAE updates its weather data, I would think, fairly frequently. I'm looking at a page here from 2005, but I know the software that I use to select it uses current weather data. So that, that's always changing. So that's the first term is uh, approach. The difference between the condenser water supply temperature and the outdoor wet bulb temperature. Next term that we're going to discuss is range, um, kind of like a delta T. Uh, so the condenser water temperature drop across the cooling tower or the fluid cooler. So as the condenser water comes into the cooling tower, the evaporative cooling process rejects heat from that condenser water and the cooler condenser water drops into the basin. So what is the delta T or the difference between the water in the basin and the water coming into the top of the tower. That's defined as the range. Now, typically in comfort cooling applications, that range or that delta T is about 10 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Now with that, I do wanna add uh, a definition of a cooling tower ton. And I've seen this already in the last year where uh, we're looking at a tower and someone believes that the ton which most of us in the mechanical HVAC industry relate a cooling ton to 12,000 BTUs per hour. One ton is 12,000 BTUs per hour, and that's pretty common. And so it's easy to get tripped up on this because the cooling tower is dealing with the condenser water. And when we're looking at condenser water, uh, we also have to take into account the uh, heat of a comp compression. So the, the heat from the motor in the compressor uh, is being also being rejected into that condenser water as well as the uh, energy from the building, right, through the cooling coils. So 12,000 BTUs plus the heat of compression, which we uh, have assumed at 3,000 BTUs per hour, gives us a cooling tower ton at 15,000 BTUs per hour. So a little bit different than, than what we're used to. So those are the couple of first uh, definitions I wanted to cover, and that'll get us into a selection here. So let's let's take a take a look at a selection. Here we have some operating parameters for the selection that we're looking to do. In this case, uh, we're looking for 450 gallons a minute uh, with a range of 10 F, so 95, 85. That's pretty typical of any condenser water system. And then uh, the entering wet bulb for this particular city, and I'm assuming this is the 0.4% uh, wet bulb temperature, is 76F. We can see at the bottom there, the, it gives us the capacity that we're looking for is uh, uh, 2.25 million BTUs, and that equates to 150 tons. This information is derived basically through the universal hydronic formula which is uh, Q, uh, gallons per minute, equals BTUs per hour divided by the delta T times by fluid factor. In this case, 500 for pure water. So if we didn't have one of those variables, we could uh, use that equation to uh, figure it out. So once the software has processed the information, it'll give you a chart, a selection chart like this with a number of variables on it. And in no particular order, the things that we're gonna consider here is the percentage capacity. So are we actually hitting the 100% capacity requirement? Uh, next is relative price. So you can see that the price jumps based on the model. That's the size of the unit and fan motors and all of that kind of packed in there. Uh, fan motors, number three. So do we want some redundancy in our fan motors? Do we want two fan motors? Just in case one goes down, we have a little bit of redundancy there. So do we want to consider a unit with two fan motors? Fan horsepower. I think this is one of mo the most important factors. For long-term operation, lower the horsepower, the better. Pressure drop. So the pressure drop through the tower for pumping efficiency. We want to make sure we're within a reasonable range there. Uh, and the biggest factor is the box size or the overall dimensions of the unit. Can we make it fit into the application? And then also in the weight has an impact there as well. So uh, we use all this information to select the appropriate tower for the application. So that marks the end of our series on cooling towers. Thanks very much for checking it out. I hope that uh, you got some value from that topic. If there's any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to me at jeffwhunter.ca, my website, 
or through any of the social media channels where you might be picking up this content. And with that, in true Canadian style, cheers. <laughs>